Just before I start, I'd like to also offer my thanks to uh, Women's Health Lot and Mallee and to Linda and to Vita Sabotka in particular for giving me the privilege of being able to be involved over the next couple of days. As Linda said, I, I told her yesterday that I'm not an expert in the sector at all, but I rely very strongly on you good people who work in it and provide me with the, the knowledge that I need to be able to take that research and those facts out to the public in the writing that I do. Um, I'm very passionate about writing about the violence experienced by women and children. And along the way, I've come across a lot of different community attitudes that may be slightly different, perhaps, to the work that you do every day, but that I think indicate more insidious kind of thinkings around violence. Um, not all of it has to do with intimate partner violence or domestic violence. Sometimes it's just the daily microaggressions or violence that um, women experience on the street uh, or in the workplace and don't necessarily feel like they can speak out against. So I'd just like to begin by saying that yesterday, the Courier Mail in Brisbane... Oh, actually, before I start, I'd just like to issue a general kind of trigger warning. Some of the things that I'm going to be talking about um, are not unfamiliar to you, but perhaps not necessarily desirable to hear about at 9.30 in the morning. Um, so just be aware of that. Yesterday, the Courier Mail in Brisbane reported on a gruesome murder that had been perpetrated in a Brisbane unit. On Saturday night, police discovered body parts believed to belong to my young Prosecchio, an Indonesian woman living here with her Australian boyfriend. Police had been called to the unit after local residents described an eye-watering smell. Once inside, they discovered what appeared to be a body part in a pot on the stove. Mr. Prosecchio's boyfriend, Marcus Volke, fled the scene when police arrived. He was later found dead in a nearby street after sustaining a self-inflicted knife wound to the throat. To those of us in this room, we understand this case to be one of the countless acts of male violence against women, which sees one woman killed every week in this country. And to revisit some of those statistics just for context, here's what we know to be the facts around family violence and intimate partner violence. One woman is killed every week in Australia by her partner or ex-partner. The most dangerous time for a woman victimised by a situation of family or intimate partner violence is the period immediately after leaving. This is when her risk of homicide is at its greatest. The Australian Institute of Criminology indicates that 36% of all homicides occur in a domestic setting. And of those homicides, 73% involve a woman being killed by her male partner. 35% of women experience violence from their partners during periods of separation. 78% of people in Australia who are homeless are, due, are homeless due to domestic violence. Sorry, 78% of people in Australia who are homeless due to domestic violence are women. One woman is hospitalised every three hours in this country. The issue of male violence against women is a grave epidemic. One in three women will experience male violence against women at some point in their lifetime. And yet, in the Courier Mail's report, efforts were made to identify Volki as having seemed happy and normal in the days before the murder. He was described as being one of those kids who'd do anything for you. He just had a feel for nature. Ms. Prosecchio, on the other hand, was unnecessarily and offensively described in the very second sentence of this article as having been a transgendered prostitute, as if the nature of her sexual biology or profession had any bearing on the circumstances surrounding her murder, or any relevance to a society of people who ought to be horrified by her death. In a postscript beneath the piece, the Courier Mail also offered this. Readers seeking support and information about suicide prevention can contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Suicide Callback Service 1300 659 467. There was no reference to support services for women experiencing intimate partner violence, no resources listed for women who may be in fear for their lives, only information provided for people, and in this circumstance we can presume that it was directed at men, who may be contemplating suicide and perhaps killing their partner along the way. Education about suicide and support services specialising in its prevention are of course vital, and I do not mean to diminish the need for these services in any way. 
But as a woman who understands the statistics around violence and women, this is what I feel when I read this kind of repackaging of a situation in which a woman was brutally murdered. I feel that the violence experienced by Mayang Prosecchio, violence which ultimately resulted in fatality, is being minimised or sidelined in subtle ways to turn self-harm into the real tragedy. And I have grave concerns for how this shifting of conversational focus and preoccupations actually benefits the women who are victimised in astonishing numbers around the country. A similar narrative occurred around the recent murders of Kim Hunt and her three children, Phoebe, Mia and Fletcher, in Lockhart. In that situation, Jeff Hunt, husband to Kim and father to the three children, who killed them all with a shotgun before turning the gun on himself, has been overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly described in the media in positive terms. A man who loved his family, a man who doted on his wife, a man who was tormented by an unknown private anguish. In that circumstance, too, the Sydney Morning Herald provided links to support services like Lifeline, Men's Line and Kids Helpline, with no mention at all of services which, is, which are well placed to support women experiencing violence or who may be in fear for their lives. And then there was the dubious speculation on disability and violence. An article in the Sydney Morning Herald's op article opened with, sorry, something in the Sydney Morning Herald opened with this line. Police believe unbearable strain and hardship brewed within quiet grain farmer Jeff Hunt following a car crash that left his wife Kim disabled. Pains were taken to quote friends, all of whom spoke in glowing terms of Hunt and his stoic res resilience in the face of his wife's accident. A friend said, he was super, super patient. He would help her get out of the car. He would hold her arm. You couldn't get a better bloke, the most gentle, considerate bloke, a pillar of society. As disability activist Stella Young wrote at the time, when we hear that, that a murdered wife is also a woman with a disability, we can find ourselves a little bit less horrified, as though her status as a disabled woman gives us a little more empathy towards the perpetrator of violence. It's victim blaming at its very worst. This sentiment did not go down well with some of the commenters on The Drum, the website which published Stella's piece. One person responded with, not true at all. What may be true is this, when we attempt to understand the strain Jeff Hunt was under since his wife's accident, we view the situation as more tragic than horrific. Language is important and it means something. It matters that in circumstances where disabled people, especially disabled women, are victimised and abused, a social narrative emerges which positions it as tragic rather than horrific. Disabled women are significantly more likely to experience violence than non-disabled women, yet excuses are more readily made about the so-called frustration felt by support workers and or partners which might lead to this abuse. Violence is repackaged as tragic rather than horrifying. Language which repackages male violence against women as the result of mental illness, strain, pressure, unresolved frustration, or even meaningless humour direct, directly contributes to the social minimisation of impact felt when discussing violence. When we turn perpetrators into victims whose actions must be understood, what we're doing is turning their victims into ciphers whose suffering is an unfortunate consequence of male pain and not a horrifying result of unregulated entitlement and frustration. Women are not peripheral side characters in the lives of men, and posing them in this way is precisely the kind of thinking which allows what is essentially a terrorist act, i.e. the ritualised murder of one woman every week, into a vague, shadowy phenomenon which can't be attributed to any one thing, and that we don't really need to pay much attention to if we don't want to. We're here over the next few days to talk about how violence prevention is everybody's business. But in order to do that, we have to be really honest about what violence is, the various ways it manifests, and how, precisely, it has been, ab it has been able to be jettisoned from society's consciousness and turned into, ma into a matter for other people to solve. Part of the problem, as I see it, is that many people have a very specific idea of what violence looks like. Typically, it's something perpetrated by evil monsters, men who live on the fringes of society and who can easily be identified by their physicality or abhorrent attitudes towards women. It's a bit like expecting that today's racists must all travel around in Ku Klux Klan outfits or Nazi memorabilia. 
And the reality is, of course, is that most people who espouse violent ideology or who perpetrate it are, for all intents and purposes, normal. They are normal happy people. They don't seem strange in the lead up to violence. It concerns me that newspaper articles continue to, to, continue to describe men like Marcus Volkey and Jeff Hunt as normal everyday guys with sensitive caring attitudes. Because to my mind, this exactly fits the profile of an average perpetrator of male violence against women. It's up to us to resist the efforts made to other perpetrators because it denies the fundamental truth of violence in all its forms, that it's about power and privilege, and that it often goes hand in hand with charming behavior, or at the very least, personable behavior. The other problem with othering perpetrators is that it removes responsibility from those people who may actually not be violent who may not actually be violent to reject violence in all its forms. And that includes the microaggressions that permeate throughout society and undermine both women's sense of self and the extent to which we can expect respect and to be treated with dignity. It is too easy to identify violence as physical behavior and decide that because you've never partaken in that, you're a good guy whose personal responsibility begins and ends there. But while we've made great inroads in a inroads in Australia in identifying more specific forms of male violence against women, we still live in the kind of toxic culture which excuses sexist and violent jokes as harmless and demands that those offended lighten up and get a sense of humour. I am a regular and enthusiastic user of social media. I use it for work and entertainment. And the amount of misogyny I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis is horrifying, particularly given the age brackets of people sharing it, laughing at it, and shrugging it off. Even worse is the backlash faced by those who do protest. We shouldn't underestimate the subtle violence of silencing people, causing them to question their own sensitivities and perception when they speak out against bullying or oppressive behaviors. My own experience suggests to me that there are large groups of young people who are being raised in a culture which either teaches them to minimize and laugh at the issue of male violence against women, or to learn that taking a stand against it will result in their own victimization. And I wonder at what point it is that our children move from the vulnerabilities of childhood, the desire to love and to be loved, and into a different kind of identity, one where they've learned to either mock or stand by such behavior as it happens. When do they learn that it's okay to laugh at images of women with bruised and beaten faces, alongside captions like, I tried to leave the kitchen once, or to enthusiastically share memes, which I've seen, depicting terrified looking women hogtied with mouth gags alongside other captions like, if she can't say no, then it's not rape. How does that happen? <laughs> Unfortunately, we can look to a broader social desire to minimize violence as part of the cause. And when celebrities, the role models of young people, share or encourage ca casual misogyny, it makes it that much harder to challenge. When people in positions of authority make jokes or participate in the kind of sexist behavior that sits on the same continuum as extreme vi physical violence, they're contributing to a culture which minimizes the value and worth of women and therefore makes it easier to ridicule them, undermine them, and ultimately harm them. Recently, an Australian hip-hop performer who goes by the name of Esso published photographs on his Instagram account with him pretending to punch a waxwork model of Rihanna. The photograph was hashtagged with the phrases, smack my bitch, and she loves the way it hurts. Rihanna is one of the most famous women in the world. She's an entertainer, a multi-Grammy award-winning artist, and an occasional actress. She's also a survivor of intimate partner violence. In 2009, her then boyfriend, Chris Brown, also a Grammy award-winning performer, savagely beat her and hospitalized her the night before an awards ceremony they were both due to perform at. When photographs of Rihanna leaked to the press, fans immediately began to speculate about what might have happened. Depressingly, significant numbers of them came to Brown's defense. We didn't know what happened, they claimed. She might have provoked him. Takes two to tango. Later, after Brown had spent a couple of years in the doghouse, the narrative changed to argue to forgive him. He'd been punished enough. Didn't he deserve a second chance? The fact that Brown never really faced any consequences is telling of the lengths people will go to to forgive abusers while ignoring the victims of their violence. 
in the most despicable display of arrogance and ignorance, organizers at the Grammys announced in 2011 that Brown had been invited to perform once again at that year's ceremony. Touching on the incident which had led to his short blacklist back in 2009, organizers had the temerity to say that it was the Grammys who'd been the real victim that night. Even now, Brown's fans, or Team Breezy, as they call themselves, are overwhelming in number and made up largely, I think, of young women who still internalise the message that intimate partner violence is no big deal and that, because Rihanna and Brown had a highly publicised reunion following the assault, it may even be romantic in some way. So when Esso jokes about punching Rihanna, he isn't making a light-hearted dad joke. He's contributing to the degradation of women in society and the demands that we be quiet about it. Worse, whether he intends to or not, he's confirming to every single person who secretly or not so secretly believes that violence against women isn't that big a deal, that they're right, that sometimes women ask for it, that it's funny to laugh about, that it might just be even okay to do. In comments left beneath Esso's photograph and then later beneath his apology, fans, largely boys and men, but with a handful of girls and women too, argued against the haters who were berating Esso for his insensitivity and misogyny. Get a sense of humour, they cried. It's just a joke. The world is too politically correct these days. Most tellingly, these defences were all offered on the belief that this joke was not really promoting domestic violence, because Esso would never condone that. As I said, we've made some great inroads into public awareness about male violence against women, but insidious strains not only continue to exist, they fester. There's scant understanding of the daily microaggressions that contribute to a culture that is violent towards women and harmful, harmful for us to be in. Women are still ritually punished, mostly verbally and sometimes physically, when we stand up for ourselves or protest language and behaviour that dehumanises us. If we complain about street harassment, we're told that we're just jealous that we don't get any. This conference hopes to address how working towards gender equity goes hand in hand with violence prevention. Currently, our culture seems to have a good grasp on the concept of publicly condemning violence, but it doesn't seem like we're sure yet what this looks like across a multitude of layers. For gender equity to truly exist, there needs to be a complete restructure of the systems of patriarchal power which largely benefit men while largely disenfranchising women. We need to work towards having equal participations of men and women at all levels of society. A surrendering of power is going to need to occur for this to properly take effect. And it's perhaps that fact which makes true gender equity such a challenge. I noted in the last week that Iceland has announced at the UN that it will be hosting a conference next year. Uh, the conference will be held as part of the 20th year celebrations of Hillary Clinton's speech in Beijing, women's rights or human rights. And as a side note, I'm confused as to why we're celebrating that, because Hillary Clinton this year alone acknowledged that not really that much has changed in terms of women's empowerment around the world. So a celebration seems dubious at best. But Iceland's foreign minister announced that Iceland would be hosting a conference that would be discussing specifically the issue of violence against women. But only men and boys would be invited to participate. And as he said, he wanted to create an environment in which the issue of violence against women could be discussed by men and boys in a positive environment. And when I hear that, I hear that when you invite women to talk about their experiences, whether or not that's of direct physical violence or just their experience of being a woman in a world which daily minimises our impact, when you invite women to participate in that conversation, it creates a negative environment for men. And it occurred to me when I, when I listened to this and when I read about this, that I'm sure all of these male leaders who are sitting around discussing the issue of violence against women and how it's perpetuated and how it can possibly stop, that not one of them might sit there and say, you know what, maybe we need to give up some power. Maybe there shouldn't be quite so many male leaders sitting in this room and maybe there should be some more women. So a surrendering of power is going to need to, to occur for this to properly take effect. And as I said, it's perhaps that fact which makes true gender equity such a challenge. 
In recent times, programs encouraging male support of women and opposition to violence have been predicated on the idea of the male protector. But the concept of male bestowed protection is one that harms rather than helps women. A society which operates along paternalistic lines is one which undermines the rights of women to exercise our own autonomy and protect ourselves. Men are not the conservat conservators of women, and it's not their morally bestowed obligation to protect us from harm. As human beings, it's the moral obligation of everybody to refrain from harming others, and we must stand side by side in solidarity on this issue. Real action requires real energy, and we need to keep demanding it no matter how inconvenient people with power find it. The truth is that if men want to be more than theoretically supportive of women's rights, the first and most important thing they can do is stop talking and listen to us. And that means giving up the microphones and op-ed inches and letting other people, women, speak for a change. We live in a society in which it's accepted that men set the public agenda and drive it, that they have more things of value to contribute, that their voices are more important and therefore deserve more space and respect. This has a natural flow and effect into the way women's, women feel we can behave in our general lives and the way men are taught to feel entitled to. Women participate in public life at a comparison of around 30% to 70%. The mirror image being reflected to us all through pop culture and the media is one in which women are naturally given less space to speak, to contribute, to lead and to be change makers. And when we take slightly more than that 30% that, that has been allocated to us, we're accused of being greedy, of taking more than our share, of being loud and boisterous and obnoxious, of being bossy. Gender equity starts with us creating the kind of world we want to live in, one in which everyone plays an equal part, is treated with equal dignity and respect, and where we are all given the ability and privilege of being able to control our own lives. I welcome you to this conference, Violence Prevention, It's Everybody's Business, and I look forward to learning as much as I can over the next two days, and together, taking one small step towards a better world for everybody. Thank you.